May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. Welcome back to the Dominion Podcast, episode season two. You kind of trailed off there. I, I, was that, did I catch a niner in there? What are you <laughs> recording the podcast from a walkie talkie? <laughs> Oh, man, we just had a great interview with Dr. Joe Boot that we're going to share with you in a minute. Um, but uh, before we do that, welcome back, Dominion Podcast. This is going to be the third episode of our Christ in the Nation series. So we're very much looking forward to uh, sharing this with you. Before we do, shout out to our sponsors, official sponsor, the Upper 40 Studio, Upper40.com. Thank you so much for the beautiful stuff, which I hope that everybody has looked at. Uh, very closely, if you could just continue to look. Just take a look at just it. Just take a look. <laughs> and of course, our unofficial official sponsor, Kawartha Classical Christian School. Um, I missed this last week, but uh, we had our celebration of excellence. How was that? It was excellent. Yeah, good. <laughs> I yeah. hope so. <laughs> yeah, every year it's just so encouraging to see the Lord's work and the students' lives and you know what 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 children are capable of our our generation has such low expectations for humanity in general and certainly children in particular yeah um but it's fascinating and encouraging to see the um flourishing of children in a rigorous christ-centered education yeah so it truly was a celebration and uh, we praise God for his work. I thank all the faculty for their hard work. I thank uh, the principal, Ryland, for his hard work. I pray for some rest this summer for all the students and yeah. families and that God would help us next year. Yeah. Um, how long do the teachers and the students prepare for, for that? Is it a couple months they um, work on their stuff? Some things are short are short term and some things are things they've been working on for quite some time. I think it some, varies. There's some pretty lengthy memorization that goes into some of those presentations. Yeah, I mean the four fives recited three chapters of Ephesians. And wow. even the kindergartens are reciting stuff and we we we've lost an understanding of the capability of children. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who've grown up in a public school system have no idea what we are capable of with God's help and strength and mm -hmm. teachers who love you and seek your good. Um, children are capable of learning and, uh, and love it yeah, and enjoy it. You can see that when you walk into the building, Yeah, that the, the teachers love the kids and the kids uh, respect and honor the teachers. And the, there's almost like a desire to, to please them because there's such a great relationship there. So, yeah. 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 The listeners also, if you're listening to us, you can check out dominionpress.ca. That's right. That's where all of our content goes. Not only our podcast, but we try to run a couple articles a week. Mm. Uh, ben Inglis is writing a column for us, which is fantastic, dealing with cultural issues. Balaam's ass. Yep. Check that one out. And, what's uh, the uh, what's the tagline for that? Not the profit you want, but the profit you need. Yeah, restraining <laughs> this week's profits. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's a it's a great read and yeah. timely. And Jacob often produces kind of a devotional um, every Thursday as well. And if you, I mean, it's been really encouraging. I've had a lot of people reach out to me in the last couple months encouraged by what we're doing at dominion and you know seeing how they can help and partner with us and um, if you want you can go to our website and there's an opportunity to subscribe so all of our content will always be free as a matter of principle um, that anyone who wants to learn can learn and receive mm -hmm. but at the same time um, our goal is to by the written and the spoken word um, proclaim the lordship of jesus christ over all things and we need help to do this. We've been given a mission that is impossible for just a small group of people. And we are not looking for likes and followers, even subscribers. We want partners in the ministry of the gospel. And if you feel so led, there's an option for you to support us by subscribing financially is to, to a monthly um, subscription that would go towards getting the word out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to let people know this, that there is a way to help us. And we hope that people share um, the content and it will remain free for all who would benefit from it as well. So check that out. We're also on Twitter, Dominion underscore press. 
And the podcast is on Twitter as well. You can follow us there and keep up to date on what we're doing. And speaking of great content, um, we just uh, did an interview with Joe Boot, which we'll, which we'll be sharing here. Do you have any thoughts after kind of decompressing for a couple minutes and thinking about it? As with all of these that we've had with, with Pastor Jacob and Dr. Wellam and now Dr. Boot, it feels like we're scratching the surface. But I think listeners will be encouraged and helped um, to think about the Lordship of Christ, to think about the extent of His reign over all of life, and, and really bringing all of our life um, in our thinking and our acting under His rule. And that's our goal, I mean, in our ministry with Dominion, mm-hmm. living under His rule and ruling over creation in His name. So I think people will be helped. You had a comment you were making kind of when we stopped just about why why is it yeah. so controversial when it's so basic? Yeah, and it, it strikes me, we, a lot of the conversation circled around law and um, kingdom, the issue of yeah. the kingdom of God came up a little bit in our conversation. And it strikes me that as the church has, uh, in a pietistic way, in just taken God's law for itself and assumed that there's, you know, some kind of uh, holy natural or d- some kind of uh, other law that's disconnected from God's character that that's for the nations mm-hmm. and we have God's law. That at the same time, we have also shrunk our idea of what the kingdom of God is mm-hmm. to merely the church. Mm-hmm. So when when we when you say the word kingdom of god a lot of christians instinctively think of church they think of the their brothers and sisters at, at fellowship they think of uh the singing the prayers uh, all of these things which of course are part of the kingdom of god uh, but we've we've limited the kingdom of god to that mm-hmm. and that's gone hand in hand with our limiting of god's law to you know the household of faith. Yeah, when you when you misunderstand the lordship of Christ and its inherent extent, totalizing mm-hmm. extent, you limit other things in relation to that. So whether it be the law or the righteous standard of God, we don't just mean as applied in the Mosaic covenant. We mean just in by virtue of creation. Um, you limit. You privatize and compartmentalize the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. All of this is rooted in a distortion about the fundamental confession of our faith that Christ is Lord and we need a we need a recovery of this Mm -hmm. and um, we need to recover a comprehensive view of Christ in whom and through whom all things exist and without this I mean it it is in, in a real sense a different faith yeah so we hope that this interview is helpful um, towards a recovery of a biblical view of Jesus Christ and inspires the worship of his people and the devotion and the love and obedience of mm-hmm. his people. Amen. Well, we'll leave you with that as we uh, switch over to the interview. All right. Well, we are delighted today to be joined by the evil mastermind behind the <laughs> fundamentalist extremist <laughs> movement in Canada, which is actually, we used to just call them Christians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, Dr. Joe Boot has agreed to join us today from across the pond. So thanks again for uh, being willing to come on the pod, Joe. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's a delight to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. So in all seriousness, uh, Dr. Boot is a Christian thinker and cultural apologist, philosopher. He is the founder and president of the Ezra Institute for Contemporary Christianity, which a lot of us have learned from and benefited from greatly uh, for a lot of years now, but especially the last couple of years. Um, He has also served as founding pastor of Westminster Chapel in Toronto for 14 years, and he now resides in Great Britain. Um, He's worked in the field of Christian apologetics, worldview education, and church leadership for over 25 years on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, He's also the author of many books. You can check them out. Most of them are at Ezra Press. Uh, The Mission of God is kind of the magnum opus, and that was a... I know an encouragement to a lot of pastors, a rich, deep, comprehensive biblical and systematic theology, and more recently, the ruler of kings um, toward a Christian view of government. This is one that we've been 
purchasing a bunch of copies of and giving out to people. And we'll probably reference this. There's a great audio book on uh, Audible as well for that one. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> By yours truly. So we would we would commend these two uh, works <laughs> and others to you as well, um, especially the latter if you're just getting your feet wet. So, um, Joe, maybe I could begin with somewhat of a <clears throat> a personal or biographical question. Um, I asked Pastor Aaron Rock this at one point when we had the interview. I've shared with you before personally that. For me, as a, as a pastor, I found myself totally out of my depth um, when the COVID shenanigans started. Specifically, I, I realized that I had there are things that I had not thought about that I was totally unaware that I had not thought about. And it was only kind of in the crucible of that crisis that I was forced to assess my views. And I had to rethink some things. I had to add to my thinking. Um, and you were a major source of instruction and encouragement and equipping in that regard. The articles that you wrote for um, the Ezra Institute, you did several podcasts, which were very um, pivotal, foundational for myself and many Christians. Um, you taught about the state and, and the church and this type of thing. My question is, as I've gotten to know and to listen to you, um, these are things that you've been speaking about, teaching on, preaching about for years now. And um, even your book, The Mission of God, I forget what year that came out, but this this is not in response to the pandemic. This is, for years, you've been talking about sphere sovereignty, for example, and the Lordship of Jesus Christ more generally. What What are some influences in your life? Maybe it's people, maybe it's theologians. Um, why was this something that was so big on your radar and it was just not on so many mm -hmm. others. Uh, that, because as we look forward, we want to make sure that we're not caught with our pants down, so to speak, again. We want to make sure that we're thinking through these things. But why has this been a point of emphasis in your ministry before it was with so many people? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, first, just let me say how much I like the backdrop of your podcast studio there with the uh, <laughs> Ontario flag and the, and, and the, and the shotgun slug over, <laughs> slug over the back. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what a good podcast studio should look like. Um, so the, um, the, the book Mission of God, as you mentioned, uh, that came out 10 years ago now. Yes. And... Um, the Ezra Institute was founded in 2009, mm -hmm. so approaching, uh, this is our 15th year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really set up to advance the very message that you have uh, just summarized and, and articulated, that we as uh, Christians have in the West for some time uh, de-emphasized or to some extent lost an understanding of the lordship of Christ mm -hmm. and the meaning of the kingdom of God. Now, for me, the the interest in all of this uh, began what in my work as a Christian apologist, actually in my 20s, uh, over 25 years ago, when I was reading the English Puritans mm. and uh, really... Uh, grappling with some of the things that they had to say about the Christian life in its relationship to the state, mm -hmm. uh, the Christian gospel, the claims of Christ in relationship to the culture, not just the kind of books that Banner of Truth have emphasized over the years mm -hmm. of Puritan piety and Puritan prayer and Puritan preaching, mm -hmm. but the Puritan world and life view, mm -hmm. uh, if even though I recognize it's anachronistic to speak of world and life view with regard to the Puritans, because they were living at the beginning of the period we now call the Enlightenment, and it wasn't really until the later, uh, a sort of neo-Puritan tradition really, um, called neo-Calvinism in the Netherlands uh, with Abraham Kuyper began to grapple with the claims of the Enlightenment philosophers. But they, the, the, the Puritans, because of the era in which they lived, did recognize the importance of various jurisdictions that God had established with both freedom and authority, 
and the importance of the claims of Christ as it related to the state, because those were the issues that they were dealing with. And um, I also spent quite a bit of time reading the the early founders of what we would call modern evangelicalism, men like William Wilberforce, uh, John Wesley, uh, and George Whitfield. And they had, um, uh, Wesley and Whitfield had kind of picked up on uh, the Puritan message, and they emphasized evangelism and Puritan piety and so on. Wilberforce emphasized also the Puritan view of moral reformation and reform. So that's where my encounter with this sort of began. But it struck me as radically important uh, as I was traveling in the work of Christian apologetics, primarily in the West, um, in the Western world, although I did spend a fair bit of time in the East and in the Far East as well, but primarily in the West as a vocational Christian apologist, I began to see the questions of our culture changing. It, when I had begun in the work of apologetics in my um, early 20s, uh, you, you, you still found that many of the questions or objections to the Christian faith were, does God exist? What about evil and suffering in the mm -hmm. world? Uh, you know, can, how can you believe in miracles? Give me three good reasons to believe in the historical resurrection of Jesus and so on. And these were the kind of areas where when we talked about defending the faith, we meant those sorts of questions. And there were basically four or five questions that were in the, uh, with the sort of major worldviewish questions that, that the apologist was confronted with. And you had these responses in the toolbox. I began to notice though, that the questions of the culture were radically changing and they were moving from those questions of what we might call church dogmatics, Christian dogmatics, mm. um, to, for a start, because the culture was becoming biblically illiterate. So they weren't, most people weren't even competent to ask questions about the Trinity or mm. the text of the Bible. Um, but they began to shift to what I would call civilizational or cultural challenges. Uh, you know, wasn't Christianity um, patriarchal? Mm. Wasn't it homophobic? Wasn't mm. it colonial? Wasn't it anti-choice? Wasn't mm. it oppressive? And it seemed to me that the questions were becoming framed in socio-political and cultural terms. Mm. And I was looking around and asking myself, where is the defense of the Christian philosophy of law? Mm. Where's the defense of the Christian view of family and human identity? Where's the defense of the Christian view of sexuality? Where's the defense of the Christian view of nationhood? Where's the defense of the Christian view of politics or economics? And I couldn't find it in the areas that I had been looking. And so uh, my explorations began elsewhere, seemingly by chance, but I recognize by providence now, mm -hmm when I was speaking at a small college, Christian college in the north of England, and as was my custom on the afternoons, uh, if I was in a little town anywhere, I would try and find a secondhand bookshop mm -hmm. and uh, see what I could find on the shelves uh, with a cup of tea. And um, I've, I went to the philosophy of religion section and uh, this little secondhand bookshop in Lancashire, and I saw this little spine on a book, and it said, why I still believe in God. And I took that book out. It was a very thin book, and it was written by a man named Cornelius Van Til. Mm. And I found that I could not put that book down in the secondhand bookstore. I'd read it within a few hours. And that was the beginning in my late 20s of my journey into uh, the reformational tradition that was resourced by, yes, the English Puritans, but then found um, uh, an intellectual and biblical home amongst those men in the Reformed tradition who had wrestled with the consequences of the French Revolutionary period, mm -hmm. people like Groen van Prinster, and mm -hmm. then uh, Abraham Kuyper, and then those who stood in that tradition like Cornelius Van Til, Herman Doyeverd, R.J. Rush Dooney, and others. And I spent then, um, well, many years then studying these men, but also putting their uh, 
world and life view uh, into my own heart and and uh, and into my own ministry and begin to articulate it in cultural apologetics, um, in the development of a cultural apologetic that would be much broader than the narrow rationalistic definition of apologetics most people are used to. And that led to my desire to plant a church in Toronto that would be built around this reformational understanding and then the establishment of the Ezra Institute to advance it. So because I had been reflecting on the issues of Christ's lordship, his kingdom, I did my master's degree then in it, focusing on the thought of these men. I then went on to do my doctoral studies in this. And um, I reflected on it in the context of both the church ministry and preaching and then in, in the work of a cultural apologist more broadly. So when the, um, and I was used to, Alex, to being in, you know, feeling very isolated mm. um you know ezra institute began in a broom cupboard at westminster chapel mm -hmm. um quite literally and uh, a website and our journal jubilee and i was used to being ignored and um for the most part and for people seeing our ministry is very much this sort of very narrow niche thing for mm -hmm. christians who may be a bit more intellectual and they like that kind of stuff but it wasn't you know, no, they're not really that relevant. Uh, I remember certain Christian leaders calling me in Canada and hysteric because of my critique of a totalitarian perspective in, in uh, Western politics and especially expressing itself in Canada. But then when the COVID era broke and we had started to roll out some worldview training, people were beginning a little bit prior to this to, to begin to see more of the relevance of what we were saying in our ministry. But when this broke, suddenly the relevance, the immediacy of the, the relevance of a robust biblical world and life view um, came to the fore. Mm -hmm. And we saw, uh, you know, a trajectory, uh, a very steep trajectory um, develop an interest in our ministry. So mm -hmm. I was one of the ones who, by God's grace, and that's all it was, that God had helped me in Christian apologetics to uh, th this understanding. Um, I was one of the ones who, by <coughs> God's goodness, uh, was able to help others who were struggling in the in the current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think were it not for the work of the Institute and uh, maybe a couple other writers for myself, like Francis Schaeffer, I think I would have been wholly unprepared. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't even I don't even remember how exactly. I think I think my first interaction with Ezra was um, when you had brought uh, Nancy Piercy up, and through reading some of her stuff, I had kind of had my foot in the door just a little bit. Not to say I also didn't get caught with my pants down when COVID hit, but at least I was aware that there was something I ought to have known, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but thank you. So that was well, very helpful. And, and on well, that note, Schaefer was kind of like that too. When you read mm -hmm. a Christian manifesto, it feels like he wrote it for today. Yeah. But he was criticized in the same way that Joe was of you're too intense. You're, you're over reactionary. You're, yeah. you're reactionary that this is not going to happen. You're whatever. When he wrote that, he was, he faced kind of the similar accusations and it's weird. Like if a reform guy can say that that book is prophetic, yeah. like it was, it feels like he just saw where yeah. we today, you know, So I guess this leads to a question that, that I have is it's easy to see these things in hindsight. But how do we go forward from here on out, being able to detect these things before they happen? Like, as, same thing with Rush Dooney. When I when I listened to him speaking in the '60s on, you know, how the government in the states was so out of control, um, you think, yeah, he's talking about this now. So how do we take these these principles and apply them to other things that maybe we haven't thought about yet? Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Schaefer, and I think he's. Uh a significant figure too. His his focus was uh, evangelism, really, mm -hmm. an evangelistic apologetic in the sixties and seventies, uh, in particular. And um, yes, he did sound prophetic. He too had drunk deeply from the wells of um, Rookmacker and Van Til, and um, to an extent, um, uh, Doyverd mm -hmm. and uh, and Rush Dooney. Uh, and so he had read. Um, some of the same people and was seeking in the work of evangelism and apologetics to address some of the same things. And so he, he especially went after the issue of abortion mm -hmm. and um, uh, Schaefer correctly was able then to 
predict some of the issues that would arise with respect to things like homosexuality and and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and other issues. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of looking forward and looking ahead, a couple of things come to mind in terms of that question. The first would be, I think there is, and I think Alex alluded to it really, and one of the things you heard actually during the COVID era from pastors was this wasn't on the test. <laughs> you know, this, yeah. this wasn't uh, part of the, <laughs> you know, this wasn't part of the, when I reminded that particular pastor where he could get some resources, I was swiftly blocked thereafter. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, so I'm not sure how interested he was in actually swatting up for the test. But um, the, 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 the issue, I think, in part was that the preparation of Christian leaders in the seminary uh, within evangelicalism, within fundamentalism, even within the reformed um, community, for the most part, uh, was and has been concerned with, of course, systematic theology and biblical studies and these things, um, more isolated areas of theological study. Yes. But actually a broader grasp and broader uh, reflection on Christian world and life view on what is the the lens that we actually bring to scripture what are the philosophical assumptions that underlie our uh, underlying our reading of the text how submitted are they to uh, a biblical world and life view itself um, so theology is never conducted in in a vacuum as such that's why there can be bad theologians and even unbelieving theologians because theology is not identical with biblical revelation mm -hmm. it's reflection on biblical revelation mm -hmm. and so I think um, much of the time there's been a lack of world and life view reflection. Certainly there's been a lack of serious attention to the prolegomena of theology. What is the underlying philosophy that we are bringing to the text of scripture as we do our theology? And in particular, we've not really reflected most pastors, you know, on the task of what is uh, the defense of the Christian view of life? What mm -hmm. is the Christian apologetic task. And if they did do any courses on it, it was in that more rationalistic evidential paradigm that I talked about mm -hmm. of really a, a sort of bygone uh, period and era. And so what people often have, uh, even faithful pastors when they emerge from seminary is maybe a bit of a handle on the, on the, um, the, the languages, on the original languages, some systematic theology, some biblical theology, some pastoral theology, but they've not actually wrestled more broadly with biblical missiology, mm -hmm. with the king, with the issues of the kingdom of God, with Christian apologetics, with a cultural apologetic, with the Christian world and life view and its bearing on our lives. And how does then, which those disciplines seek to ask and answer, how does the the, the, the basic the uh, assumptions of our reform theological framework or our evan theological, evangelical theological framework, what bearing do they have for us as we think about Christ's claims in relationship to culture, mm. in relationship to politics, in relationship to law and education? The simple fact is, is that the seminaries have not prepared us mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we, as we, as you know, we lost gradually the universities from being Christian institutions in the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. The seminaries were developed as a response to the loss of those universities to train people for ministry. But that it tended to make pastors very narrow mm -hmm. uh, in their preparation. And then with fundamentalism, we became concerned primarily with, if we were concerned with evangelism, with soul winning. Uh, and with personal piety and spiritual disciplines, but not the broader questions of civilization that many of our reformed forebears were asking and were wrestling with because of their cultural moment. We can understand why to a degree. We just emerged in a sense from in the 18th century from the evangelical awakening and then the second great awakening in the 19th century. Um, there was a kind of presumption in the West up until certainly the end of World War II that we were basically a Christian culture. So the issue was really evangelism and the life of the church and that education was broadly Christian and law was broadly Christian. And, and then as culture began to change, we started developing eschatologies, theologies of defeat and retreat and escape from the world mm -hmm. rather than thinking through 
what are the implications of our faith, of our, of our biblical commitments, of our creedal confessions for real life in the world. <laughs> and so I would say that the, the way we have to prepare is to not make the mistake of previous generations of overlooking a um, huge part of our response. It's not just pastors' responsibilities. I don't want to put this all on the pastor at all. Pastors have a particular focus on the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments, the exercise of church discipline. But in their preaching of the word, we need that awareness of the scriptural world and life view as it informs our reading of scripture and what the meaning of the gospel of the kingdom really is that moves beyond just personal salvation and the ecclesiastical sphere into all of life. And so we need that worldview paradigm so that we are able, when these things come and start to happen in our culture, we notice, ah, that's a totalitarian framework for thinking about politics. That is a critical theorist, neo-Marxist view of human identity. There is a socialistic view of economics. And we begin to recognize how these are anti-Christian and anti-biblical, and we learn to speak against them prophetically. We learn to teach and preach with respect to them to our congregations so that they are prepared in their vocational environments to also address those issues. It seems, it seems <clears throat> though, that worldview thinking as you're describing it, really is predicated upon your understanding of the biblical teaching on the Lordship of Christ. Because without that, worldview thinking is kind of, it's not a parlor game, but it's, to a lot of people, it's, it's okay, that's interesting information. It's good to know that you can put things together. But kind of, it seems like what's driving you and the Institute and, and your ministry is, no, because Jesus Christ is Lord over all, then we need to think in terms and everything that we think about needs to be in reference to him. So it's not, it's not just an intellectual game that you're playing or, or um, just connect the dots kind of things. I remember you saying uh, multiple times, something to the effect of, you know, we're not supposed to just think Christian thoughts. We're supposed to have every, we're supposed to think everything Christianly about everything. Mm -hmm. Think Christianly about everything. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's actually yeah. a different paradigm, and and that's built on your view of who is Jesus. Like, and this is where the the issues of the pan the the so called pandemic really came home to me is that this is not just a political thing in a narrow sense. This has to do with who is the Lord Jesus Christ and what are his claims over his creation and. Um, you know, what, what does it mean to be, even to be a Christian? So, I don't mean to come across as sectarian, but these are, there's a sense in which you have to, to reject these things is to reject Christ in some way. Um, so, a, a specific yeah. question for you on that, Joe, is one of the contributions you've made uh, is a recovery of the idea of sphere sovereignty. And... Um, we can, we've talked about this on the podcast, just this is a biblical idea, you know, even when Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to, to God what is God's, he's, he's limiting that which belongs to Caesar, which a lot of Christians are not aware of. And so, from, the, from Christ himself, there's always been a, an acknowledgement, and we go back to Genesis 1, of the limits to human authority and the... Um, I guess, spheres of responsibility that God has built into the fabric of creation. Could you just maybe explain to us what is the doctrine of sphere sovereignty and how is that important to understanding the Lordship of Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you've articulated that, articulated it that way, because um, what we're not, what the need of the hour is not some vague vanilla worldview analysis, mm -hmm. kind of intellectual game mm -hmm. or just or just intellectual exercise mm -hmm. um the because at the root and foundation of the christian world and life view of the biblical teaching which is all we mean when we talk about biblical world and life view, what we mean is what are the structural features of the biblical message as a whole uh, and the structural feature of the biblical message creation fall redemption through the lord jesus christ by the powerful working of the holy spirit at the center of that 
who is both creator and redeemer, who is reconciling the world to himself, mm-hmm. it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. He is the Archimedean point, if you will. He is the fulcrum on which all things turn. Paul mm-hmm. deepens our understanding of creation, uh, as does the Apostle John, by telling us that all things hang together. Mm-hmm. Literally, all things hold together in and through Jesus Christ. We always sign off our podcast, as you guys probably know, with Romans eleven thirty six: mm-hmm. for from him and through him and to him are all things. Mm-hmm. So when we get that famous statement of the nature of the defense of the faith from the apostle Peter in 1 Peter three fifteen, he begins by saying, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Mm. That is, in the very root of your being, set apart the Lord Jesus Christ, set apart Christ as the Lord. And then you can be ready, right? Then always be ready to give a defense, Mm -hmm. uh, give a reason for the hope that is in you, Mm -hmm. uh, but with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Um, So that apologia any successful, any any faithful, I should say, defense of the faith is predicated on Christ's lordship. Mm-hmm. And this is where the issue of sphere sovereignty is so very, very important. Because the creational principle of sphere sovereignty is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm-hmm. He is the creator and redeemer of all things. Mm-hmm. And he has image bearers who he has given authority to Mm -hmm. so we have uh, in in the book of genesis of course with the imago day you've talked about that the fact that there is a commission that in fact when you ask what is a human being well we're homo religiosus we're religious beings we're responding beings homo respondents um but we are um fundamentally cultural beings because we there is a calling to rule and subdue to turn creation into a god glorifying culture Mm. and the bible has a term for that it's called the kingdom of god Mm -hmm. now in order to do that to be we have to be given a certain amount of authority rule and authority Mm. to be given a jurisdiction Mm. we are in that sense vice regents or better still vice gerents were those who rule not alongside but under uh the lordship of jesus christ and so human beings uh are the in a certain sense the center of uh, are at the center of the god-given meaning of creation they are to bring out its potentialities to 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 uh, bring out the meaning, the meaningfulness of creation in terms of God's word. And to do that, Christ has given us uh, authority. Now, that authority um, is diversified in creation. So it doesn't concentrate in any one individual or any one institution. Now, of course, we see in Genesis in creation, we've got the family Uh, marriage and family where we see rule and authority and headship is established so there we have uh, an 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 institution that's established by god but we also see in the fullness of time and with the reality of um, sin in the world we see the institution of uh, the state Mm -hmm. and we see the people of god being gathered both in the older and the newer covenant so Mm -hmm. There are other spheres that we could talk about, but for the sake of simple explanation, Mm. the ones that are easiest to talk about are the family, the church, and the state Mm -hmm. as three uh, touching, but um, uh, they they, they touch, but not overlapping um, spheres of authority that God has established. And um, just like we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, But by good and necessary consequence, we recognize it's taught there. I'm not claiming we find the expression sovereignty leap off the page of the New Testament or the Older Testament to us. uh, But it's there by good and necessary implication. Saul, you'll recall, king of Israel, loses his kingdom for presuming to act as priest Mm -hmm. in the place of Samuel. Mm -hmm. So we see throughout Scripture 
God establishing a distinction and a jurisdiction for king or state. Uh, and look what is required of the king. The one specific requirement of the king in Israel is that he reads the law of God so that he's not lifted up above his brethren. And God's concern is to limit specifically the king in terms of wives and chariots and horses and gold and all of those things to avoid the development of a pagan power state, which is what you see outside of the biblical uh, teaching, biblical world and life view. So we have the family which is given jurisdiction and responsibility to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Uh, it's given control of, of property, um, of welfare, and then we see responsibility and authority given to the church. We are, after all, as Christians, prophets, priests, and kings, and so the church is given the power of the preaching, of the public preaching of the word of God, the administration of the sacraments, mm -hmm. the administration of church discipline, mm -hmm. and the prophetic witness to the world, to culture, and the state is given as a ministry of justice, as we see in Romans 13, to punish evil and reward righteousness, in terms, of course, uh, of God's order. So sphere sovereignty basically means Christ is creator and redeemer and sovereign over, overall, and he has delegated uh, areas of both authority and freedom in both family, church, and state, and beyond, spheres of authority and freedom uh, that are to submit to him and obey him. Now, of course, they can disobey him. Mm -hmm. They can rebel against him. But there are always consequences mm -hmm, for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't, if we reject the fundamental principle of sphere sovereignty, then what we basically end up with is a situation where one of those spheres seeks to swallow and control as though they are, uh, the other spheres are lesser parts of mm -hmm. a whole, the other spheres of life. And what we've seen in the West in particular, in the modern age, um, yes, there are. This has happened with the family. Think about mafia in Italy, for example. That's the family, uh, in a certain sense, in a totalitarian way, swallowing church mm -hmm. and state, um, or seeking to control church and state. In the medieval papal theocracy, we saw an attempt of an ecclesiasticization of culture, an attempt for the church to control all these spheres. The modern age, with secularization, we see the totalitarian impulse of the state to treat family and church and economy and vocations as lesser parts of itself. Mm -hmm. It swallows them up and controls them. So we are left basically with a naked individual mm -hmm. before the state. There are no then pre-political institutions or authorities. The state isn't there then simply to protect those institutions. It seeks to control, dominate and uh, consume them. And so that's the tremendous value of sphere sovereignty as fundamental to the Christian worldview is it protects the issue of freedom and authority under Christ mm. and liberates us, church, family, and government, actually, to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, basically, as by creating the Christ created the world, the world is created through him and for him, and he has given particular responsibilities and corresponding authority to different jurisdictions. And one of the implications of this is that the right worship of the Lord Jesus Christ must recognize these. And this is where it becomes, this is not like, we're not discussing organizational theory for creation, <laughs> like it's, it's some mundane topic of discussion. We're talking about what does it mean to worship the Lord Jesus Christ? And you can't actually do that if you don't know what your duties are. And if you don't know who your duties are too, and those are entirely understood in a covenantal context, what is my, my relationship to um, other women is not the same as my relationship to my wife, my responsibilities to them, my authority in relation to them. My responsibility to other children is not the same as my responsibility to mine and my authority doesn't match. And it's funny how right. Christians will acknowledge this when it comes to the family but when it comes to the state, they don't acknowledge this. No. They think that, well, you can't limit the state's responsibility or they're not Christians. They don't believe that or some type of thing. But what we see in the place of sphere sovereignty um, and the God-ordained realms of authority and the harmony that ought to exist between them 
is authoritarianism, mm -hmm. which is the wrongful assumption of authority or a false ascribing of authority to someone at the expense of another. And it's kind of an, it's an irony. I mean, Nine Marks recently came out with a journal, a huge evangelical organization, you know, kind of warning about the rise in Christian authoritarianism. It's like, okay, there is a problem of a rise in authoritarianism, but it's not from the people who say we should limit the authority of the yeah. state, <laughs> right? It's not from the people who say we should recognize what the Bible teaches on spheres of authority. Mm -hmm. those, those are not, those are the anti-authoritarians. Yeah. Well, you see what's going on there is that you see, because the default position is statism yes. yeah. in the Christian church, yeah. precisely because of what you've just described, mm -hmm. we don't recognize the limit and jurisdiction of the state. Mm -hmm. We've become statist. Mm -hmm. I often say that most Christians today are, like a Toyota Prius, they're part Christian, part humanist, secular humanist in their thinking. <laughs> then Nine Marks assumes that what Christians who speak about Christ's lordship want to do is control all the levers of power and have a totalitarian state that's just Christian instead. Yeah, sounds like that they want to establish some kind of authoritarian ecclesiocracy. Yeah, so they don't recognize the principle of sphere sovereignty, mm -hmm. and therefore they can't actually grasp the meaning here. Uh, and significance of the Christian world and life view. And I'm glad you've put it the way you have, because this is not some op smorgasbord option among many. Oh, well, some people have this view. Of, there's loads of views of Christians in politics, you mm -hmm. know, and there's a whole smorgasbord of valid ideas about how we organize human society and, and the state. Well, no, there isn't no. any more than there is a smorgasbord allowable of views um, of marriage, mm -hmm. Uh, or of the nature of the church, mm -hmm. uh, the nature of the state, mm -hmm. uh, and the nature of human institutional social relationships is governed by the word of God. And there aren't 15 multiple views uh, that, are all, um, that are all equally valid. We have to push back against that. I have a chapter in my book, ruler of kings called the heresy of liberal democracy which makes some people's mm -hmm. hair stand on end <laughs> um, but what i'm concerned to point out in that chapter uh, is that um liberal democracy as it's today understood and is adopted as the default position of most christians is heretical in terms of the creedal confessions of the church of mm -hmm. jesus christ mm -hmm. when you look at the creeds of the church the most basic summaries of christian doctrine that christ is lord he's creator he's judge he has absolute authority um when you look at what we then say about civil authority and then relate it back to the creeds it's actually heretical mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we don't see it as heresy because it's not ecclesiasticized so mm -hmm. we we tend to think of heresy only as expressing itself in the ecclesiastical life of the church so somebody in the church is denied the doctrine of the trinity and therefore they're a heretic but we don't say yeah but what if somebody's just denied the lordship of christ over the state oh well that's just politics and there's all kinds of views of that mm -hmm. we we think because it's outside of the uh, institutional life of the church mm -hmm. that we can't talk about it as heresy, mm -hmm. but it actually is. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there's there's an objective standard, and I mean the example again. But going back to the family, if my neighbor, who's an unbeliever, comes over and says, you know, I want to sleep with your wife, or I'm going to discipline your children, and my I wouldn't respond with, well, you don't believe a Christian view of family, so why not? Like no one, no one would say that. We would say. No, you have no right or authority to do this, and it's irrelevant whether you acknowledge that, which mm -hmm. leads me to my last question to you, Joe, and then we'll let you get going, is um, the word theonomy has become kind of a, a, a dirty word in the evangelical circles, and as I've kind of stood back and watched this, it seems, again, like a lot of it is an intentional straw man argument. Um, that, that, that there are legitimate concerns about how do we apply all of Scripture to life? And I mean, this was a controversy in the early church. How do we apply the Mosaic Law um, to, to the church? How do we incorporate Gentiles? There's a, there is a sincere concern here, but it seems to me the majority of the outrage has to do with people just 
not comfortable with the totalizing claims of Christ and his word. That just that idea rubs against the grain of a pluralistic church and culture. So I'm going to, I read recently another article by Lehman and his first footnote, he, uh, he defines theonomy as those who see a direct one-to-one correspondence of the Mosaic civil laws and civil society today, which no one is currently advocating for. That's not a real position that anyone is advocating for. And he goes on to say in the footnote, you know, if you mean general equity theonomy, which is a more contemporary term, it's not, um, then, then essentially we land in the same place. But the point I'm trying to make is there's this caricaturing of theonomy, which simply means God's law, as an extremist view trying to impose every civil code one for one to Canadian culture today. So what is your definition of theonomy and why should we not be scared of it? Well, first of all, um, to, to men like Lehman and others, the, the first question I would ask, and I, and I will define theonomy in just a second, but is, are we going to charge God with immorality mm. and injustice. Mm. I mean, even if his definition were correct, which it isn't, mm. uh, it's a straw man. Mm. What? Why is it that we as modern Christians are so offended <laughs> by the law of God in a way that previous generations of Christians were not? Mm. Uh, the Puritans were certainly not offended by the law of God in this way. The evangelicals, the, the early evangelicals, was, were not offended by the law of God in this way. The Pharisees were offended by the law of God. They preferred to replace God's law with their tradition. Now, oftentimes Christians think that uh, Jesus' um, opposition to the Pharisees was because they were so committed to God's law mm-hmm. and that he was, um, he was trying to overturn that mm-hmm. um, with grace. Mm-hmm. And therefore, he condemned them for their their attention to God's law. That's actually not the case. Jesus' arguments with the Pharisees are always around their rebellion against God's law. Mm -hmm. He said, you neither know the scriptures nor the power Mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you you nullify, you make void the law. He gave, in several places, uh, gave illustration of this. By your tradition, you want to put human tradition in place of the authority of God's law. Mm-hmm. And so it is interesting to notice that when we uh, look at, go back to creation, we've got the 10 words of creation. Mm-hmm. And then at Sinai, when God uh, establishes a free nation and says, this is what freedom under God looks like. Mm-hmm. And he gives them a constitution. He utters the 10 words, mirroring the 10 words of creation and some of it goes back to creation law itself the Mm -hmm. sabbath for example Mm -hmm. and god himself in exodus 20 cites the creational sabbath as the foundation of uh, of of rest of sabbath law Mm -hmm. and when god sends his prophets to prophesy against um the surrounding pagan nations through amos or through the or to the heart of the assyrian empire in jonah or when he casts out the Canaanites out of the land, on what moral th- on what moral basis mm. were these people charged? Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't on the well based on the Assyrian understanding of law and morality. You're in violation of your own moral codes. That's therefore, right. you need to repent. Mm-hmm. Or to the pagan nations around Israel. Well, according to um, this law or that local cultural law, uh, you're not being very obedient to your positive law order, Mm -hmm. and therefore God is judging you. No, God's judgment was based on the righteousness of his law. Yeah. Uh, And this is why in Deuteronomy 4, we see that Israel is a light to the nations. It's a model. Its law order is a model to the nations. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, the first question to ask ourselves as Christians, in the quietness of our own hearts is why when I read God's law, which Jesus says I've not come to abolish but fulfill, to bring to its fullness, to put into force, till heaven and earth pass away, not a punctuation mark is going to pass from this law. Why would my heart be offended Mm. 
by the righteousness of God, by the justice of God, by the faithfulness of God? Is it because somewhere in my heart I nurture a desire to sin? Mm -hmm. Do I like those sins? Do I want to coddle those sins? You know, when laws drop off the statute books of any nation, it's because juries are no longer convicting people on the basis of those laws. Mm -hmm. That's why they disappear. A jury of your peers will no longer convict you on the basis of it. Why? Because the jurors are themselves engaging in those sins. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that we, we see, for example, um, uh, as you look at Puritan England, in 1650, Oliver Cromwell's government made adultery punishable by death, mm -hmm. a maximum sentence of death. Uh, but do you know how many people were executed for adultery during Cromwell's uh, 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 era as Lord Protector? No. Zero. Mm. But the illegitimacy rates of, of Britain dropped to their lowest in the since well from the time that records have been known mm. compared to about 45 percent today they dropped to 4.5 percent in his day because mm. that was the teaching value the teaching function of the law because law teaches us values so the um the 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 definition of theonomy from uh, the perspective of the contemporary theonomist, certainly my definish, uh, definition of theonomy, is that it is, as you've said, it just means God's law, and it means that way we pay attention to the details of God's law, to God's revealed law uh, within our family, within our church, within our culture, and of course, eventually, uh, once again, within civil government, mm -hmm. as a righteous people demand righteous laws. We look at then what we call the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the standing law of God. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, reflect on the application of those standing laws as they were applied or positivized in Israel in the case laws. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the minimal cases that are given as illustrative of how the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, actually apply and so what we're looking for as christians today is what are the principles within the decalogue what are the valid principles of god's law that we must now apply and positivize uh, in our own historical context that's what we really mean by the general equity mm -hmm. of a law mm -hmm. i think it was greg barnson who gave the famous illustration it's one among many of you know putting a fence around your roof well you don't do that in Canada we don't do that in Canada because the snow falls on the roof and our roofs are like this mm -hmm. and nobody has a party on the roof mm -hmm. um, but they did in the uh, the Middle East mm -hmm. and so but we do fence our swimming pools for similar reasons mm -hmm. so what we're looking for is the the valid principles the equity of those laws mm -hmm. as the principle passes into our current environment mm -hmm. the case laws don't cover of course all or the contemporary and modern possibilities of law, because law in that sense is the implications of God's law unfold in history mm -hmm. as circumstances, cultures, contexts develop. We start to see the depths of the wisdom of God's law as we see how it can be applicable into a, a, a vast array of circumstances and situations. And this is what Christians have done from the time of Alfred the Great in the mm -hmm. ninth century, as they were beginning to apply the resources of God's law to the contemporary situations in which they found themselves. So when mm -hmm. we talk about theonomy, we're not talking about some wooden thing mm -hmm. that doesn't have the ability to flex. I mean, mm -hmm. I could talk at length about the flexibility that's built into the older covenant law even in its positivization mm -hmm. in israel for mm -hmm. example the penalties are maximum penalties they're not not mandatory penalties mm -hmm. except in the case of first degree murder mm -hmm. uh, there are other penalties available to the magistrate exile for example corporal punishment restitution so there are all kinds of there's all kinds of flexibility built in there already and what's required of us is that we take seriously the fullness of God's law in the totality of his word. And don't forget, it's not just the Decalogue or the 
uh, didactic portions of God's law in Torah that we're talking about here because the Psalms are declarations of God's theocracy over all creation, of the rule of his king and the authority of his law. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, which mm-hmm. is a celebration of the law of God. Mm-hmm. The prophets are all calling people back to obedience to the covenant law of God. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom literature, like the book of Proverbs, is a father teaching his son the law of God. Mm -hmm. And the meditation on the meaning of life in Ecclesiastes concludes with a call to obey God's commandments. Mm -hmm. And so that's why enter the ministry of Jesus as he recapitulates in a sense the story of israel he goes through the waters just as israel did he goes out into the wilderness there he defeats the temptation of satan as the israelites couldn't do in the wilderness and he does it with the law of god Mm -hmm. and then he comes back out of the wilderness and he goes up upon a mountain as the greater moses and he expounds the full meaning of the law and so it's not a wooden thing, this kind of Lehman caricature of some one-to-one uh, civic application, as though that's what the theonomic uh, 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 tradition is. It's not at all that. It's saying, how do we take and accept the authority of the fullness of God's law, looking at principle and practice? Okay, some practices have a past, but what is the valid principle that is still there Mm -hmm. for example the mixing of fabrics Mm -hmm. um that practice has passed what was it illustrating well the distinctiveness of god's people well that principle goes on and is taught within the newer testament Mm -hmm. um we're not even to touch the 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 clothes uh, stained by sin and evil according to the apostle jude Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so but where principle and practice coincide Still, take, for example, issues of human sexuality. Why are we not taking seriously there the full meaning of God's law? Mm-hmm. Even the what we would call the ceremonial aspects of the law are not set aside. Calvin saw them as transposed. So today, Christ is our great high priest, and Christ himself is the sacrifice who intercedes today at the right hand of God, sprinkling his blood upon the mercy seat. So the ceremonial aspects are enforced in the vicarious atonement and intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So theonomy is about taking the fullness of God's law word and hammering out its valid principles in practice today Mm -hmm. for our own culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think, again, there's a legitimate debate and discussion that needs to happen around how do we do that? And there will inevitably be disagreements, you know, hermeneutically on what applies and how it applies. And mm-hmm. that's that's a fair and reasonable conversation. But we're, it seems like a lot of people are just skipping that or rejecting that by saying it shouldn't apply. And we need to respond as Christians yeah. and say, no, 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 that is not a Christian position. You, to, to reject the gods, that there is one standard of righteousness in the world, regardless of whether people believe it or not, that that's God's word, that he has revealed it to us, and that it is our, our duty to apply it to our lives mm-hmm. is just, there's no Christianity apart from that. And I think that, again, that's what no. we want to make plain, that we're not getting yeah. hung up on some obscure application of Mosaic law here. We're, we're trying to say that, that everyone, there can only be one standard of righteousness. Yeah. And if that is not God, um, what is it? You know, it, it, if it's not the God of the Bible, mm-hmm. then it's an idol. Yeah. And, you know, we need to reject these caricatures so we can have a, f- a fruitful conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have time to ask you one well, more every... quick question, Joe? I'll let you, sure. you, you, yeah. were, you were starting to say something there. You go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just going to just very, very quickly say, you know, what, what king is there who doesn't have a kingdom and what kingdom is there that is not governed by a law? Yeah. If Christ is king of kings and Lord of lords, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth then that kingdom has a law, and God has given that law. And Jesus doesn't issue a new Ten Commandments. He refers people to the law 
that he has given. And Paul makes two very interesting applications, uh, just very simply and very quickly in terms of what you've just said. Um, when he, first he's talking about marriage and family, and in Ephesians, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise attached to it. Um, and he actually tells us there that um, that rather than saying, you know, if you honor your father and mother, you'll, you'll inherit the land. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he says you will inherit the world, the earth. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. So um, he expands, because of the expansion of the reality of the covenant, he expands the significance of that commandment yeah. and our inheritance um, to the whole earth. Mm-hmm. And then Paul takes the, the case law of do, don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, mm-hmm. and he applies the equity of that commandment to how we are to care for those who minister the word of God as pastors, bishops, elders in the life of the church, that they are worthy of double pay, mm-hmm. of double honor. So this is the, the example that the Apostle Paul actually gives us. Why mm-hmm. would we not follow that example? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's been super helpful, Joe. I know you. Uh, we're going to let you get going here. We could go on forever. I feel like we're just scratching the surface, but... Again, we're so thankful for God's providence in your life and leading you to that little bookstore and that little book and yeah. the journey that that led you on theologically. And um, yeah, we're encouraged. Again, we'll let our listeners know that there's exciting things happening at the Ezra Institute, the appointment of uh, Pastor um, Nate Wright to the Director of Canadian Operations. And uh, yeah, we pray the Lord's richest blessings upon you brother and your family and your ministry and pray that it would increase so thanks so much for joining us thank you and i'm going to leave thanks us, brothers uh, appreciate it thanks for having me i'll leave uh, i'll leave us with uh, the words of the great pagan king nebuchadnezzar at the end of the days i nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and i blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Mm-hmm. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of, uh, of the earth. We'll see you next time on the Dominion Podcast. Thanks, Joe. Amen. Thank you.